Father, we thank you, O oh God, for your grace and your mercy. Father, we thank you now for the preaching hour. Pray now, O oh God, that you would hide me behind your cross so that men, women, and children do not see me, but certainly, God, that they hear from you. Father, we thank you now for this gracious moment. We pray now in the name of Jesus, O oh God, if someone doesn't know you in the pardon of sin, they would come running asking, what must I do to be saved? Father, we thank you now. And we bless you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah. Come on, put your hands together and let's bless God. Yeah. Amen. Why don't you stand with me and turn to Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 through 8. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. When you have it, say amen. amen. Isaiah chapter 6. Don't be afraid to use the table of contents. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 through 8. Amen. Hear the words of our God. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. With twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice to him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of clean, unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. I want to talk from this subject today, what we need in times like these. What we need in times like these. During fearful moments in the height of World War II, a comforting hymn was written called, In Times Like These. In the midst of a busy day, a housewife by the name of Ruth K. Jones felt a direct inspiration from the Holy Spirit. She stopped her work to quickly put words and music together, just as they were given her by the Holy Spirit. Hear the words that she wrote. She literally wrote, in times like these, you need a savior. In times like these, you need an anchor. Be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds a grip, the solid rock. Chorus line, the rock is Jesus. Yes, he's the one. The rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure, be very sure, your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. And then simply titled it, In Times Like These. Miss Jones, somewhere between what was going on in World War II and in her life, she recognized that there was a chasm between what she was dealing with and the reality that we all face. And she had enough sense to put pen to paper and literally wrote in times like these. Because she understood that if you're going to live and deal with the struggles that life presents, you need an anchor that's stronger than you are. She literally writes to help you and I to appreciate that when we go through the struggles of life, when we're dealing with the great chasm that exists between reality and things that are not real. We have to learn how to anchor ourselves and even our hope in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. She begins to help you and I to understand that in this life you will deal with trials and trouble. But when you're dealing with those trials and troubles, it's just good to know I got something to lean on that won't let me fall. She helps us to understand that when we go through life and whatever we deal with, that our anchor ought to be Jesus Christ. And so it is, as we see this uh, particular movement in the text. It helps us to understand that the occasion of this text, King Uzziah has now died. The Bible teaches us that it had been 
been 52 years of prosperity for the people of God. Yeah. The northern kingdom was doing well, and Isaiah was sent there to be the prophet unto God's people. Yeah. He had the responsibility of offering sacrifices once a year. He was a temple prophet or a temple priest. He had the responsibility of helping the people of God to see God and see God clearly. Yeah. But somewhere between the 52 years that his heart had venerated toward King Uzziah, he forgot the task that God had given him. Somewhere between the prosperity that was going on in the world, he lost sight of his call to preach God's word. Yeah. And I want to suggest to you today that that is the awful tragedy that we deal with every single day. We have more and more pulpits that are losing sight of the responsibility to proclaim God's word. And so it is, as Uzziah is now dead, King Uzziah is now dead, and Isaiah now is speaking to the people of God. Isaiah was called to preach a word of repentance to the people of God during the reign of King Uzziah. Yeah. And now as this system now has moved and he has now died, the people now are frustrated. Yeah. They're now afraid. And here is Isaiah now. He's now running around like a chicken with his head cut off. Yeah. He's a little frustrated now, but then he finds himself in the sanctuary. Yeah. Shows up into the sanctuary and recognizes that the king of glory is still on the throne. Yeah. When he finds out that the king of glory is still on the throne, own, he recognizes and begins to start repenting unto God. He sees God that is still on the throne and a temporal king who's not on the throne. He now recognizes that he had put his faith in something that was temporal and he should have put his faith in something that is eternal. Now he begins to look at this now and recognize that he has committed a sin before God. And now he begins to speak to God's people to help them to appreciate that the king of glory is still on the throne. And I want to suggest to you for a little while, if you will, three things and I'll take my seat. The first thing that this text is telling to teach us is in times like these, we need a right assessment of who God is. Because watch what he does. The question that dominated Isaiah's thinking was what would happen to Judah if King Uzziah had died? And he said, I saw God's position in verse number one. Like all devoted citizens his heart had somehow venerated unto King Uzziah. 52 years of prosperity, 52 years of achievement, 52 years things were going well. And now King Uzziah has now died. And he says literally in verse number one, I see the Lord on the throne of glory. Isaiah really didn't see God until Uzziah died. And it helps you and me to appreciate it that he needed to learn that although the king was dead, the king of glory was still alive. And I stopped by to let somebody know today that whatever you're going through in life, you need to know that the king of glory is still alive. God's glory impacted the prophet profoundly because he had been in God's presence. And I want to suggest, believers of God, that when you are in God's presence, you can't be the same. He has now moved into God's presence. He has now seen the king of glory that is on the throne high and lift it up. And now he recognizes that God had never gone nowhere, but he had gone away from God. He recognizes that God, the king of glory, is still there in his presence and in his awe, but he also helps us to understand that he saw the personality of God in verse number two, and then again in verse number three. The angelic beings in the temple proclaim holy nature of God three times because they recognize the person of God. To recognize God is to worship him. In other words, Isaiah said that I went into the presence of God. And because I went into the presence of God, I saw God in his holy splendor and recognized how worthy it is for him to be praised. And I stopped by tonight to suggest to somebody here today that when you get into the presence of God, you ought to recognize how worthy it is for him to be praised. When you think about what God does for us, when you think about how God moves in and throughout our lives, God is worthy to be praised. But not only does he see the personality of God, but as a temple priest, it was his responsibility to help people see the reality of a holy God in their lives. But instead, he was so engulfed in the fame of a temporal king that he forgot the king of glory was still alive. And we must be careful in the 21st century church that we don't hoist folks up over and above the king of glory. We have gotten to the place now where we praise and worship.
worship and give adoration to people and things and forget who God is. And so it is, he helps them to understand that the king of glory is still on the throne. Finally, Isaiah understood that Isaiah might have been a good king, but the Lord, holy God, was the greatest king that he could ever serve. I like that because I'm reminded of Louis the 13th back in the old 1800s that when he died, he was one that always wanted to be worshipped. He talked about that when he was young and before he died that he was called the great state. In other words, there was nobody greater than Louis the 14th. He said that when he died, he wanted everything to be lit and he wanted to make sure that when he went into the tabernacle in his dead state, he wanted to lie in state. And so while he's lying in state, he left specific instructions that they would dim the lights of the tabernacle and they wanted to put one candle over his coffin like he lied in state. He said because he wanted to signify how great he was. It was then the Bishop Maslin who's now giving this eulogy who stands up over him and begins to start talking in the midst of talking. He leans down and snuffs out the light and says there's nobody great but God. And I want to suggest to you today that when you understand who God is, you understand there's nobody great but God. And when you know who God is, you can worship God in spirit and in truth. But can I show you something else? He sees God's presence because we are told that the house was filled with smoke. This was the symbol and the presence of God. Watch the movement here now. You will notice that God's train filled the temple. God was the central figure of the temple. Isaiah had somehow misplaced that God was no longer the central figure of the temple. And I wanna suggest that in this 21st century church that we have now misplaced that God ought to be the center of everything that we worship. That when God is no longer the center of our worship, when God is no longer the center of our praise, when God is no longer the center of why we rejoice, when God is no longer the center of why we pray, we have lost sight of who God is. But I wish there were at least three or four of y'all that don't mind testifying that when I come to church, it's not the worship of man. When, when I come to church, it's not to worship a choir. When, when I come to church, it's not to worship anybody else but God. And when you come to church with the right motives, all I got to do is call his name. And if you call his name right, folks will be able to give God worship and give God praise. There's a second thing that this text is telling to teach us, and that is in times like these, we need a right assessment of our sinful state. When you look at verse number five through seven, when Isaiah saw the Lord, he instantly realized that his heart went right. Don't y'all miss that? Isaiah probably thought all was well in life until he saw the king of glory. The idea here is that you can't come in contact with God and think that you're right. Watch what Isaiah does. The truth is we all think that we are somehow or another a well until we see the Lord. Isaiah thought that life was going well for him because he had not been in the temple for a long time for the right reasons, which carries the idea you can come to church and not be in church. And there are a whole lot of folk that come to church and they're not really in church. Some of y'all thinking about shows that you want to go see, you thinking about food right about now, you can't come to church and really worship God unless you come to church with the right spirit. Put your name and say, what kind of spirit did you bring to God's house? And not only that, believers of God, anytime the measuring stick or we make the measuring stick the human condition, we'll always think that we're better off than what we really are. Isaiah looked at the sin of a nation and thought that he was better off than the people. But it wasn't until he went into the sanctuary and saw God face to face. Child of God, anytime you go into the sanctuary and see God face to face, he sees the things that don't nobody else see. I know you dressed up tonight. I know you look pretty good tonight, but he knows what's in your closet. He knows what you're thinking.